Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fenway Quintet's presentation of Fire in the Big Top! Now, my name is Zach, and I will be your narrator today. And I'm going to tell you a story from a long time ago about two children named Tom and Maggie, who lived in Quincy. But I'm not going to tell the story all by myself. I'm going to need your help, too. Now, later on in the story, I'm going to ask you to make some noises and even do some singing. So you can help make this story as exciting as possible. I'm also going to get a lot of help from these five musicians from the Fenway Quintet. Now, they will be helping me tell this story today by playing their instruments. I'm, I'm going to introduce them a little bit later, but for now, let's get on with the show. Now, our story begins over a hundred years ago in this city of Quincy. Now, not too far from here. Tom and Maggie, the two children I told you about, had just left home one morning and were headed off to school. Their father had packed their lunches, given them a hug, goodbye, and now he was watching as they headed down through the center of town. Now, it was a beautiful autumn day, and the two children skipped down the sidewalk, their book bags swinging back and forth, and their jackets flapping in the October breeze. <laughs> Center, Maggie said to her brother, Look, Tom, there's something going on over there. Now, Tom ran over to a crowd of people that had assembled next to the stone memorial. He squeezed past the legs of the grown ups to get a good view. Now, it's some kind of concert or something, he said to his sister, and indeed it was. Sitting in front of them was a group of five musicians, each holding a gleaming brass instrument. Now they arranged their music in front of themselves, and the crowd murmured with anticipation. Shh, said Maggie, they're going to start. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Rob, and the musicians you see before you are members of the Bay State Circus Band. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And when you see the Bay State Circus Band in your city, you know that the Bay State Circus will be here too. Tickets are on sale at the Big Top for only five cents. But Harry, today is our only show here in Quincy. And after we've done, we will pack everything away and head to the next city for our next show. Can you believe it, Tom? Said Maggie. A real circus right here in Quincy. Oh, I wish we could go. Well, stop wishing, said Tom. We'll be in school at 10 o'clock, and besides, even if we didn't have school, it would cost us three nickels. One for me, one for you, and one for Father. 
to go to the show. That's almost 15 cents. We could never afford that. <laughs> Tom looked glum. But at that moment, the musician continued. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a few hours, you will be treated to the finest circuit this city has ever seen. It will be a feast for all of your senses. You will see the amazing performers. You will feel the electricity of the air inside the big top. You will see, you will hear music that will tingle your spine as you watch the stupendous feats of the trapeze artists, the acrobats, and of course, the dangerous wild animals. Tom started to jump up and down with excitement. Oh, the animals are my favorite part. I really like the scary ones, like the tiger. Tigers don't s aren't that scary, said Maggie. They're actually very intelligent, and they only attack when they're threatened or hungry. Don't pretend to be so brave, Maggie, Tom said. You may be a little bit older than me, but if you ever came upon a tiger that wasn't in a cage, you turn and run just as fast as your legs could carry you. Ladies and gentlemen, before performing our selection for you this morning, allow me to introduce the members of our band and the instruments that they play. May I direct your attention to the four different instruments featured in our band. The trumpet, the French horn, trombone, and tuba. Some of them are big, and some of them are small. But they are all the same in some ways. First of all, each of them is made out of the same metal. That's why they are all called brass instruments, and they are each a part of the same instrument family. It's like our instruments are brother and sister to each other. Our instruments are also similar because they are played in the same way. To make a sound, each of us takes a breath and buzzes our lips like this. We then take that buzz and buzz into a mouthpiece like this. <laughs> that sounds silly, said Maggie. I can't believe you have to buzz your lips to play those instruments. That doesn't make any sense. Hearing Maggie's voice, the musician stopped, turned, and looked at her. Well, my fine young friend, perhaps you have forgotten that we do not play just the mouthpiece. We have to put our mouthpiece into the instrument. And then, when the buzzing passes through our lips into the horn, then, amazing sounds come out. While the musicians were playing, Maggie slunk behind Tom in embarrassment. Father always told me to keep my mouth shut at concerts, she said to him. Oh, I'm always getting myself into trouble. I should have listened to him. Now that there are no more interruptions, allow me to tell you about one more way that we can play our instruments. We can all put something inside of our instruments called a mute. So we're now all going to put mutes inside of our instruments and play that same piece again for you one more time. <laughs> that our instruments are all different sizes. The largest of these instruments is the tuba, and it plays very, very low. Allow me to introduce Cameron, who will now play something for you on his tuba.
The trumpets are much smaller than a tuba, so they play much higher. My friend Spencer and I will now demonstrate our trumpets. different and they certainly sound different too. But they are similar in one way. Each musician has to press these buttons called valves. They help us to change the notes that we're playing. As we play today, you can watch our fingers and you can watch as they move as fast as trapeze artists somersaulting through the air. Maggie whispered to her brother, I wonder how they learn to move their fingers so fast. They must practice a lot, said Tom even more than the trapeze artists. Now, the French horn is a medium-sized instrument. It sounds right in the middle, not very high and not very low. I'd like to introduce Sarah, who will now play something for us on her horn. Thank you. 
of the huge red and white striped circus tent, towering three stories above the ground. The throngs of people were milling about outside the circus tent, waiting to get in. Maggie pulled Tom's arm. Maggie, what are you doing? He asked. Come on, Tom. Now's our chance, she replied. We'll be able to sneak into the circus if we just pretend we're with some of the grown-ups. That's not right, Tom said. Maggie was three years older than him, and she was always getting him into trouble with crazy schemes. Besides, we're supposed to be at school, and if Father finds out that we've played hooky, we'll catch it for sure. And just then, Tom caught a glimpse of the most marvelous person he'd ever seen. A tall, lanky gentleman dressed in a fancy striped coat and wearing a black top hat that seemed to reach the clouds. The ringmaster, said Tom, I would give anything to be a ringmaster someday, to be in charge of the entire circus. <sighs> Maggie said, well, you'll never get to be a ringmaster if you don't know anything about the circus. Oh, come on, let's do it. It's just this once and father will never find out. We'll just be sure to be back home by three o'clock. He won't know the difference, let's go. Maggie's plan worked. And in a moment, the two children were inside the big tub. They scrambled to find a spot on the rickety old benches that surrounded the center of the tent. Look, Tom, Maggie said, the circus parade is starting. <laughs> Thrill to the stupendous 
hilarious stumbles of the acrobats, laugh at the antics of the world's craziest clowns. And don't forget the stars of our show, a menagerie surpassing even that of the queen of Sheba herself. Wild animals, assembled from the most exotic locales across the globe. Lions, monkeys, camels, elephants, stallions, even a ferocious tiger, all the way from the jungles of India. All are here today to amaze and astound you with unbelievable feats you have never seen before and will never soon forget. And now, help me welcome our animal performers by joining me in a special song. Listen carefully and sing along when you're ready. Let's go to the animals, the circuses in town. Tigers, monkeys, elephants, sights and sounds of the circus as the animals acrobats and clowns passed by in an endless parade maggie cried out oh tom this must be the most wonderful place in the world it sure is said tom this is going to be a day we will never forget well it turns out that tom was right he and his sister would never forget this day but not just because of the circus now the children were in for something they did not expect. You see, on the other side of Hancock Street, trouble was brewing in old Harrison Sweeney's stable. Now, the stable was a cool, dark place, even in the middle of the day, so if old Mr. Sweeney ever needed to go in there, he would carry in a lighted candle. But he was a forgetful old man, and that day he left the candle on the door of one of the stalls where he kept his horses. Now, boys and girls, you know that you should never, ever light a candle if your parents aren't right there with you. And that's because the flame of one little candle can be a dangerous thing. Now, after old Mr. Sweeney left the stable, one of his horses backed up against the door of the stall, knocking the candle onto the floor. It skipped Quickly, the flame jumped from the candle to the hay, strewn about the ground. It skipped across the floor like a water bottle. Then, before you could say, old Mr. Sweeney, it reached the bales of hay, stacked against the wall. The dry hay burst into flame, and in another minute, the wooden walls of the roof of the stable were on fire, too. The fire spread to the next building, then the next, until it threatened to cross the street and enter the park where the circus was in full swing. Now back under the big top, Maggie and Tom had no idea what was happening, of course. But there was a little girl who had stepped out of the tent with her mother to get some fresh air. I, I think she might have been scared by the clowns, actually. 
She was only six years old, but still she sensed that something was wrong. The air was still heavy, like something terrible was about to happen. It was the heat of the fire that she felt first, making her eyes water as the air got hotter and hotter. And she started to hear a deep rumbling sound like this. I'm grown-ups. Can you do this with me? Make the hot sound of rumbling fire. Good job. Now next, the little girl noticed columns of thick black smoke rising above the buildings as the fire came closer. The orange-red flames that... Oh, girls, now can you help make the sound of smoke? It goes like this. Great job! The orange. Uh, the last thing she saw was the most terrifying. It was the most dangerous part of the fight. The orange red flames that tried to gro gobble up everything in its path. Now, boys, it's your turn. Can you make the sound of flames? Rub your hands together or slap your legs with your palms. But great, everyone, keep going. Now, when our little friend saw the flames, she knew that everyone at the circus was in trouble. She grabbed her mother's arm and screamed as the fire raced across the park toward the tent. They saw that there was nowhere to go but back inside. Fire, they yelled as they got back in the tent. Screams and cries erupted in every direction. Maggie grabbed Tom and pulled him through the sawdusty aisles, hoping to get out in time. People were running every which way. No one knew where to go. They just knew they had to get away from the raging fire in the big top. You see what I'm doing right now? Yeah. Whenever I tell you to make noise during the show, if I go like this, that's when you've got to stop. All right? Yeah. Now, well, you can imagine that all that smoke and fire would soon attract the attention of the Quincy Fire Department. Now, that day, the fire station was at the top of the hill, and Lonnie McIntosh was on duty in the watchtower. He had been standing there all day, 20 feet above the roof of the building, scanning the city for signs of trouble. And it was easy for him to spot the black smoke rising from old Mr. Sweeney's stable. The moment Lonnie saw the smoke, he reached up and rang the huge bronze bell that was hanging above his head. It was loud and you could hear it no matter where you stood in the whole city. Oh, it sounded a lot like this. When the firemen heard that bell, they knew what they needed to do to get to the fire station right away. Now, after Lonnie rang it, he scrambled down the rickety old ladder and into the stable area where the horses were kept. He opened the doors of each of the horse stalls and led each of the horses quickly into the garage, where he attached them to the pump wagon and ladder wagon. Meanwhile, the rest of the firemen had arrived at the station, and they were already grabbing their big black boots, fire hats, axes, and buckets. Before you knew it, they were all racing down the hill towards Hancock Street. They arrived at the big top just in time. They battled the fire with hoses and buckets until it was under control. Good work, men, said Fire Chief Munjoy. Now let's hope the fire hasn't already spread to another part of the town. Now it looks like everyone in the audience escaped safely, said Lonnie. But should we go inside to make sure no one is left? Good idea, the chief said. So Lonnie and the other firemen trudged through the muddy ground and through the singed canvas of the circus tent. Now when they got inside, they were surprised to find the ringmaster and about a dozen circus workers still there. And they weren't alone. They were surrounded by all the animals in their cages. Animals are just as afraid of fire as people, 
said the ringmaster. We were afraid they would get spooked and escape. So we had to stay and make sure they were safe. The elephants, horses, monkeys, and lions are all in their cages now. A chief Munjoer wiped his brow in relief. I'm glad all the animals are accounted for then, he said. The ringmaster, however, shook his head. They're not, he said in a hoarse voice. The tiger is gone. We don't know where he is. He must have escaped out back in all the confusion. Luckily, he didn't hurt anyone, but we don't know where he is, and he is very dangerous. Meanwhile, Maggie and Tom were running up the fire hill and away from the fire, running up the hill and away from the fire just as fast as they could go. Maggie, cried Tom, why are we going this way? Everyone else went back toward the cove. We're going to be at the best place we can go, to the fire station at the top of the hill. The firemen will keep us safe. But when they finally got to the brick building at the top of the hill, they saw that it was empty. No horses, no pump wagon, no ladders, and no fire. Breathing heavily, Maggie said, they must have all gone down to the park to fight the fire. Let's just wait here until they get back, and then they can take us back to father. Tom gulped for air as he tried to catch his breath. He turned to look down the hill. He could see all the way down to the park and beyond it, to the back cove. Look at the smoke all over the city. The fire is all the way down to the park and beyond the back cove. He said, we'd better get inside, said Maggie. The two frightened children hurried into the building. Let's hide in the stable through those doors at the back, said Maggie. The kids ran into the stable and shut the doors behind them. The horses were gone, of course, and the doors of the stalls were shut. Bales of hay were piled everywhere, looking like toy building blocks. So Maggie and Tom collapsed on the hay bales, worn out from fear. From fear. We're safe now, said Maggie quietly. The sweet smell of the hay comforted them, and in no time, they had fallen asleep, their bodies aching from the long run up the hill. It wasn't long, however, before Tom woke up. Oh, something was wrong, he thought. The air was strangely still and heavy. It didn't feel right. Like he looked around the empty stable. The door to the garage was still shut, but he got up and slowly to make sure the door was still locked. But as he approached the door, he thought he heard something, something odd, like a low rumble. Yes, there it was again. He reached out for the door handle, but stopped himself. He remembered what he had learned from Chief Munjoy when the fire chief had visited the school last year. If you ever suspect a fire, don't open the door. Feel it instead to see if it is hot. The fire is all the way down the hilltop, though, and the fire department must have put it out by now, but being cautious, he reached out and touched the thin wooden door. Ouch! He cried, snapping his hand back in vain. The door was as hot as a frying pan. Maggie, Maggie! He cried as he ran back to where his sister was sleeping. Quick, get up, the fire is here. Feel the door. Maggie jumped up. It must have come up the hill, she cried. But now they could feel the heat from the fire on their cheeks. Now, grown-ups, can you make that sound of heat? Oh, keep going. Yeah. Maggie, Tom cried. Look at the walls. Maggie turned her head and saw little wisps of smoke curl through the cracks in the thin stable walls. Smoke, cried Maggie. Cover your mouth, cover your ears. Now, girls, can you make that smoke sound again? Great, keep it going. Now, the kids knew that smoke was dangerous as flames, so they each grabbed a rag from the stable floor. If only we had a bucket of water, we could do what Chief Munjoy taught us, dip our rags in the water and cover our faces, said Tom. If we had a bucket of water, we could try to put the fire out, said Maggie. Suddenly, there was a crash in front of them. The stable doors cracked in two and fell apart right in front of them. 
To their horror, they can now see into the garage, and it was covered in flames. The flames had burned through the thin stable doors. Boys, can you make that sound of flames? The red orange flames began to consume the walls next to the doorway. The heat was unbearable, and smoke was filling the room. What are we going to do, Ty, Tom? I know, cried Maggie. She grabbed Tom by the collar and pulled him out of the stable. come closer. Holding Tom close to her, Maggie said, if we hide here, we'll be safe for a little while, but we don't have much time. When the fire gets in here, it will eat through the hay like it's tissue paper, and we'll be gunners. I hope the fire department will get back here soon, Tom exhaled deeply. Hold me tight, Maggie, he said to his sister. Tell me it's going to be okay. But it was not okay. In fact, things were about to get a lot worse. Beneath the sounds of the heat, smoke, and fire, the kids heard an even more frightening sound. It was low and menacing, like huge metal steam engines grinding their gears. Tom, do you hear that? Maggie whispered. Yes, said Tom. What is that? They listened as the strange, menacing sound grew loud. Maggie grabbed Tom's arm. Tom, she whispered, we're not alone in here. Something terrible is in the stable with us. Something that shouldn't be here. Slowly, the children peeked from under the hay bales, and they saw something moving slowly in the other corner of the stable. It was orange and black, like the fire itself, and just as dangerous. They saw its brilliant black eyes, straight body, and long tail. Back! Something else is hiding in the stable. It's the tiger from the circus! in fear as they stared at the tiger. His brilliant black eyes stared at them with fierce intelligence. He was pacing slowly back and forth in front of them as if he were stalking prey in the jungle. Maggie, said Tom, why isn't he attacking us? He knows we're cornered. He can gobble us up whenever he wants. I don't know, said Maggie. Maybe he's scared. He came to the fire station to hide from the fire too. And now he's trapped just like us. What are we going to do? Asked Tom. We can't just stay here. He might change his mind and decide he wants a little snack. You're right, said Maggie. If only we could get over to the back wall of the stable and hide in the stall where the tiger was hiding, we could shut the gate and at least he could get to us. But even if we couldn't get past the tiger, there's too much smoke in here now. We'd choke before we got there. But then, as the kids watched, the tiger did something they did not expect. It crouched down and began to crawl on 
its belly, like a caterpillar inching on a leaf. What an odd thing to do, Tom thought to himself. The tiger continued to crawl on his belly across the stable. Then he lifted his head and looked right at the kids. It's almost like he's trying to tell us something, said Tom. He knows we're stuck in here along with us. And his best chance to get out of here is if we help each other. I know it's crazy, but maybe he's trying to show us something that will help us. That's it. Maggie tried something. We crawled on the ground like he's doing. Oh boy, this thing, I think we'll be able to make it. Just keep low. If the tiger is really trying to help us, maybe he'll let us get by. Let's go. Maggie grabbed Tom's arm and they crouched. And they ran as fast as they could to the other side of the stable. The tiger watched them as they ran by, but he didn't pounce. In a moment, they were safely hidden away in the stall on the other side of the stable. Tom pulled the gate shut behind them. You were right, Maggie, said Tom. He doesn't want to eat us after all. Well, we're safe as long as he doesn't jump over the gate and into the stall with us, said Maggie. But we haven't got much more time left before the fire gets to us. But by now, the flames had entered the stable. The black smoke was getting thicker, and they knew that they only had a few more minutes of air. Now, everyone, can you make the sounds of the heat, the smoke, and the flames? Yeah, excellent. Excellent, good, keep it going. Now, the children felt the heat on their cheeks, and Maggie looked at her brother. Tom, I think we're in real trouble. We have nowhere to go. She reached out and grabbed his hand tightly. Things were looking bad for the two children. But then something happened that made it even worse. As Tom and Maggie watched through the slats of the gate, they saw the tiger, who had been watching them warily, suddenly turn around and face them head on. Keep it going, keep it going. Slowly, he raised himself out of the crouched position and began to move toward them, staring at Tom and Maggie with those brilliant eyes. Tom, said Maggie, he's stuck with us. Now I know why he didn't pounce on us before. He was just playing with us, like the way a cat plays with a mouse before it eats him. The tiger was just waiting to get us cornered. Suddenly, the tiger reared up on its hind legs, and it was almost eight feet tall. And as it pawed at the air, it let out a terrible roar. The kids screamed and shut their eyes and waited for it all to be over. A moment passed and Tom slowly opened his eyes. There the tiger stood, still standing up on two legs and pawing at the air. Maggie, he didn't pounce on us. We're okay, he said. Now, maybe he's trying to scare us. Maybe he's not trying to scare us, said Maggie. That must be just a trick he learned in the circus, but why is he doing it? He must be trying to tell us something else, said Tom. When he was crawling on the ground, he was telling us to do the same, and now he wants us to stand up tall and reach to the sky. How is that going to help us? Now Maggie looked around. I've got it, she cried suddenly. Look behind us. There on the wall behind them was the ladder that led up to the watchtower. That's it, Maggie said. He's telling us to climb the ladder. That's our way out. Let's go. Now Maggie stepped on the bottom rung, reached up like the tiger had shown her, and grabbed the highest rung she could reach. Now, the ladder was old and rickety, but she knew that the firemen climbed it every day. So, she turned, took a deep breath, and began to climb. Come on, Tom, she yelled as they passed through the cloud of smoke. Don't look down, Maggie said. We're almost there. Tom and pulled him 
up into the watchtower. We're safe for now, from the fire for now, she said, but if the fire then doesn't get here soon, the whole building will go up in flames with us. I can see them down in the park way over there. If only there was some way we could tell them we're here. But there is, said Tom, the bell. He reached above his head and grabbed the thick rope hanging from the copper, and he pulled it as hard as he could. The bell started to move slowly back and forth, and the harder he, the harder he pulled it, until the bell finally started to ring. <laughs> Chief Munjoy heard the bell. He knew what had happened. Someone must be trapped at the fire station, he said. Lonnie, take a crew and head up there as fast as you can. From the watchtower, Maggie and Tom saw a fire wagon race up the hill towards them. They're coming, they're coming, cried Maggie. Tom, we've done it. We're going to make it. We're saved. In just a couple of minutes, the fire department arrived at the station with a pump wagon, and soon the fire was out. Meanwhile, Lonnie climbed up the long ladder to the watchtower and carefully helped Tom and Maggie down. When Tom touched the ground, he immediately ran up to the fire chief. Chief Munjoy, he said, you've got to go back into the fire station. The tiger from the circus is still in there. You've got to save him. The chief looked at him strangely. There's a tiger in there? He asked. Yes, but, but don't be afraid, Maggie said. He's not dangerous. He saved us, and now we have to save him. At that moment, the ringmaster arrived with a wagon from the circus. In the back of the wagon was the tiger's cage. One of my crew saw the tiger headed to the fire station, he said. Stand back while we go get it. He's in the stable in the back. Make sure he's all right, cried Tom. The ringmaster and three of his men went to the fire station carrying a large net, avoiding the blackened walls and the waterlogged hay bales. In a few moments, they reemerged with the tiger safely in the net. As they loaded him into the circus wagon, he looked at them with his clear black eyes. He's an amazing animal, thought Tom, so brave and so smart. Tom and Maggie, a voice from behind them, father, the kids cried, and turned and gave him a big hug. I was so worried, he said. Miss Wilson from across the street said that she saw you at the circus tent earlier today, and when I heard there was a fire, I ran to the big top, but you weren't there. I thought I had lost you forever. Father, we're so sorry, said Maggie. It was my fault. I convinced Tom to skip school and go to the circus. It just looked so wonderful, and we wanted to see it. Now, Papa's face softened. I am disappointed, he said, but all I care about now is that you are saved. Come on, let's go home. But before he could even finish, the ringmaster put his arms on Maggie and Tom's shoulder. Now, wait a minute, sir. He said to Father, I'm going to need some help getting the tiger and the rest of the animals back into the circus train. Your children certainly know how to handle wild animals. It seems, and I need a couple of people to lead our circus parade back into the railroad yard. What do you think? Papa replied, well, I don't suppose there's any harm in it now, as long as they parade straight back to school when they're done. Well, then it's settled, the ringmaster said. It looks like I have a couple of honorary ringmasters today. Hooray for Tom, hooray for Mary, for Maggie, and hooray for the circus.